education, I will be in a village, I'm not sure what I will be doing. Alright, so when you talk about the importance of education, it is something which is big within myself. But before I talk about the importance of education, I want to tell you a little bit about our mentorship program. We have African Australian Youth Mentoring Program, which I'm going to tell you in five minutes or less than that, so that we give more time to our keynote speaker. Uh, we have a program which was started in 2018. And we can start and start it before that, which was uh, called by then Stop the Violence. And we wanted to stop the violence when there was violence in uh, Victoria, and we found that it was important for us to uh, proactively uh, pro provide the tools necessary for our, our young people to uh, stop the violence within the community. And we planned that program, we trained our first bunch, we trained our second bunch, and then we found there was a gap because the people we are tra were training were between 20 and 25. And when they went to the schools, we wanted to pair them as, pair, as their peers. And the standard which was done by uh, Dr. Kwajo as an evaluation of that program brought to us that we needed more mature people to be involved in the mentorship program. And then that's when we started Mentor Me Reconnect. So instead of us dealing now with the, the youngsters, we are dealing with both the, the young to be peers, and we are also dealing with the, the, the older ones to be models and to be a parent figure to our youngsters in schools. And that's the way Mentor Me Reconnect started. Mentor Me Reconnect cut across not only schools, we have Mentor Me Reconnect, which re reconnect students to the teachers, students to their career, students to their parents, students to the community, and we also have a mental living connect within the community whereby we get the, the youngsters who are at risk and then we bring them either to their career, help them to get back to their career, help them to go and finish their, their studies, help them to stop the antisocial behavior. So that's, that's what we are talking about, mentally reconnect. If you look at the, the, the booklet you've been given, it explains quite a lot about our program, our uh, mentally reconnect program, and our stop the violence program. Now, what we have listed and we are now looking at is that if we develop capable community leaders, the violence will stop. And we are saying violence stops with leadership. If we get a good leadership, which we are now targeting to get men and women, young girls and young boys to be leaders, then we are going to literally stop the violence. And by doing that, we are trying to make every person to be a champion. 
be a champion to the next person. You know, as you become a champion to, to someone else, look for a champion. So as you champion someone else, look for somebody who is a little bit ahead of you and let that person champion your life. And as you champion other people, you know, because I know I'm reminded that the, the, the Dead Sea is called dead because it does not have outlets. If you keep on getting, getting, and you're not giving, then you eventually die. And that's what we want to avoid in this scenario. And therefore, we are trying to get great champions within our community, as well as getting great leaders for us to address or eliminate the, the violence. Our program for, to, for today, we are going to change a little bit. There was a pipe hole, we are not supposed to be having that big break. <laughs> so, so we are going to address that <laughs> as we continue. Yeah, uh, we have, um, we are supposed to be having our president Joe, but as I, as I told you, we have our keynote speaker who we are going to introduce in a, in a few minutes. And then after the keynote speaker, we are going to go straight to the panel discussion. And we have our panelists who we are going to, to uh, introduce to you as we continue with, with the Panel, the panel discussion, we have our panel moderators. I want to introduce our panel moderators this time because if you have got something you want to ask and you don't know how to ask it, you can actually pass it over to our panel moderators and they'll be able to ask. But Barnabas, Barnabas is one of the students in the, mentor, in the, in the current program. And Faisa is also one of the students in the current program. One of the things we tell them that when we have programs like this, they, need, they, they, they participate for them to sharpen their tools which they have been taught. And um, then we will continue with the program the way it is. And I want to say that OAC is a not-for-profit organization and is run for Africans, by Africans, for Africans who are in WA. That's our motto. And we have got very many events, but one thing we want everyone to know is that you can be part of OEC, you can be part of OEC, either as a core participant, as a sponsor, or a volunteer, or a, a, a committee, or, or, or a planner. We have got, we've got our program, the African Australia Youth Mentorship Mentoring Program. It has got all these things. We mentor the youngsters, we educate them, there's education, there's career and professional development, there is leadership, as I've already said. We emphasize on self-respect, collaboration, and contribution to the Australian community and economy. We don't want to rely on being given. We want ourselves to be producers. We reduce and ultimately stop the violence. And finally, it is what we are dealing with today. We advocate that violence stops with leadership. So and we believe that leadership is literally strengthened when people are educated. The program as an historical uh, foundation, which I've already talked about, we started it in 2018, and today it has graduated more than 100 mentors, and we have more than 200 mentees in various schools, and we have more than 50 mentees in the community. We have literally gotten people who have been in on drugs and we have rehabilitated them and they have gotten jobs. We've gotten people who have dropped from school, we paid for them to go and do courses and they have gotten jobs, they have gotten, they have gone back to jobs. So it is, it's, it's, a, it's a program which is working and we, we are very proud of it. Uh, this program has, has all these topics, we've already covered a halfway and therefore today we are covering the importance of formal education, where after we have covered all those other topics, uh, we have had different uh, speakers for different programs, or different topics. And now, to deal with the importance of education, as our keynote speaker, we have Dr. Kwaido. As you say, he did not give me what I need to say, but I know him. <laughs> so I am going, I'm going to introduce him. You know, in the best way I know him. Uh, I'm not reading anything, Doc. So you better, you better sit properly because I may say things you mean. Dr. Kwaido is a senior lecturer, am I right? Yeah. At ECU. He is married to one wife. 
At least I know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's a father. Uh, he's a, a pastor, a senior pastor in a church which is not far from here. And if you feel like you don't want to talk about education, you want to talk about uh, spiritual matters, <laughs> he is here to, to deal with that. Uh, Dr. Kwanjo is a researcher. And he is very passionate about social change and the things which bring positive impact on anybody. Whether you are an African or whether you are an Australian, whatever you are, as long as it is impacting you positively, that is his passion. And we could not have any better person to talk today about the importance of formal education than Dr. Kwanjo. Put our hands together as we welcome. Uh, you have got a tea tomorrow morning. <laughs> So grateful. I thank you for the kind words and the introduction. Um, maybe one correction that's that there are many other qualified people who could have delivered this, but I feel privileged that on this occasion you have called upon me. So I want to thank, first of all, my God who has made it possible for me to be here. And I also want to thank um, my wife who stands by me. Um, we've been married for just 19 years and still counting. Let me acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, um, the Nyunga land on whom we meet, and um, elders past, present, and emerging, and as well as um, elders within our community as Africans who are contributing to our lives. OAC executives and team, I want to thank you as well for calling upon me. I don't take it lightly. Um, it's an honor to be here. Let me also acknowledge my colleagues who are here, Babs, this is the first time we are meeting in person. We've just been awarded an, uh, a grant to research East Africa, but we've never met in person. <laughs> so, good to see you. Richard as well, thank you so much for coming. And Salome, uh, we go back to some dangerous places. <laughs> all right, so, and all of you, I want to thank you so much um, uh, for your time. Today, um, talking about formal education, I need to take my time because I get a bit passionate about this. So when I pause and I'm, I'm taking a deep breath and all that, it just means I'm trying to slow down the tempo. I must also warn you that English is not my first language, so you need to pay attention. I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to try as much as possible to be respectful to the Queen of England by respecting the rules of English with the grammar, syntax, and all that comes with it. So what I thought I should do is maybe first provide you with some context around where we are as a community in education. And then um, after that, talk about in, in broad brush strokes, just dot points of education, the importance of it. Because I believe that there are very many qualified people here who are going to take your questions and also contribute to the discussion. Uh, but if there is any place that I would like to draw my attention on or focus more on this morning, it's mostly on the, the challenges that we face as a community relative to education. I say that because I have been privileged um, to work in some spaces of education. So first as a teacher or an educator, and also as a researcher, and also as, a, if you like, an, an implementer of community educational programs. So I come with this, um, if you like, this eclectic background of having to um, draw on different aspects which gives me the perspective of what I present today. And then, of course, in the end, I will try as much as possible to um, offer some ideas of the way forward, which I believe will ignite the discussion for today. Right, so education importance of formal education. I'm, I'm glad that this was contextualized or it was situated within formal education because we can have formal education, informal education, and non-formal education. Um, but um, all three have their way or they have their role to play in the socialization of the person. And today my focus will definitely be just on um, formal education. So by formal education, we are talking about 
the structured, organized learning where people sit in a classroom or they go through some kind of um, certification or qualification in either a secondary college starting from primary in some countries, nursery, down to higher education or obtaining vocational or technical education. This is what is normally um, conceptualized as formal education. So at the end, uh, people have to sit, be taught by someone, unlike informal education, um, get certificated, get recognized, and then a claim as you are now qualified to do something. Well, um, I like to always problematize something, some of the things I do because of my background as a researcher, and that is, I always ask the question, do people need formal education to actually be able to make it in life? And the answer is no. That in actual fact, um, statistics and the facts prove that there are some people that have actually made it in life without formal education. Thomas Edison, the man that invented the um, light bulb, uh, dropped out of school. Um, Bill Gates, the Microsoft man, also didn't cope with the vagaries of education, formal education, as we say. Um, Steve Jobs, same thing. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, the man that is causing all of us to face the book. <laughs> he also dropped out of school. Um, Oprah Winfrey is also um, someone that is not accredited with any kind of formal qualification or education. And uh, these are people that have actually made it big. If you look at it or if you, 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 you quantify success in monetary terms or you want to conceptualize success as being big or being influential, there are some people who have made it. Now, this said, and, and, and of course, I've got so many other names like Larry Ellison, uh, Michael Dell, Paul Allen, and this, all these influential people who have gone on to do great things in life, to change society without having formal education. They said, we don't have to throw away the thing with the muddy water. The reason I say this is because there are more or there are majority of people that have influenced the world who have formal education. So the Steve Jobs, the Mark Zuckerberg are just an exception. Majority of people that have made it or who are influencing the world are actually people with formal education. And uh, interestingly, those people that we will consider as exceptions today are contributing to formal education. They are investing in, in foundations and they are investing in a lot of social in, um, enterprises in, in um, low-income countries to better educate people. So those who didn't have formal education are now contributing to formal education. That must tell you, perhaps it is the system they found themselves in which they couldn't cope with. But not that formal education in itself uh, should be demonized. I hope I'm making sense with that. All right. Okay, so um, highly successful people out there, many of them um, have been able to shape their talents. They've been able to do great things in life without education. Uh, they couldn't have done it. And I'll give you a few names. Barack Obama, the first um, African-American who became the president of America. Himself and the wife, Michelle, were all formal educated. They had uh, law degrees. And I believe that without, uh, maybe, uh, I mean, as academic, I shouldn't say never, but without formal education, I don't think Obama would have ever ventured to the White House. Don't forget it's white house. <laughs> so it was education that took the black man to the White House. Very important. Um, again, the richest black person, I'm not talking about African, the richest black person in the world, Dangote Aliko, a Nigerian, is also a person that earned a university degree. Aside from the African side of things, I always like to, because the contest is African. Um, I also want to talk about Ellen Musk. He has a university degree. He is currently the richest person in the world. Um, Jeff Bezos, the Amazon man, um, who is also in the, I think he's in the top three richest people in the world. He also has a university education. Michael Bloom also is educated, and the list goes on. My point is this, those who have made it without formal education are just an exception. And when we admit exceptionism, 
we are actually admitting also that there is mainstream. That the existence of exception means that there is mainstream. And the stats and the facts prove that majority of people who have played it were actually people that went through formal education. So what does education do for a person? I wouldn't be standing here without education. I'll tell you for a fact. I, uh, you don't want to know my background because it's not good. Um, but education is what has changed this person standing in front of you. Um, I couldn't speak good English until actually uh, my third year in secondary school. Uh, I always struggled with people with grammar. But every step along the way has contributed to who I am today. I'll, maybe because of my bad manners and as well, maybe let's go back to the scriptures. Forgive me those who are not church, just, just as an illustration, I'm not preaching. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ gave a, a, a parable and he said that someone was going away and he called three of his servants and gave them talents. One person he gave five talents, another person he gave two talents, and there was still a third person whom he gave one talent. Now, if it were Australia, definitely the newspapers would pick this up. This is discrimination. <laughs> this is unfair. And I'll tell you what, there are, there, if you live in this country, you have to learn ways and means of getting around. Anytime somebody is doing something like this, especially in the workplace, use the word discrimination. <laughs> it terrorizes managers and uh, all the other work races. Okay. But guess this. People, on the official value, you would think that the person that had five had an advantage. That the person that had two also had an advantage over the person that had one. But I stand here to prove to you that um, the master who gave them the different talents actually gave it to them according to their ability. And it was left to them to turn things around. Let's do the maths. If you have, you have one, if you have two or you have five, all you need to do is to start adding zeros. If you add two more zeros to the one, it becomes 100. The one that has five still stays at five. If you add three zeros to the one that was given two, it becomes 2,000. The one that had five stays there. That also means that if you have five, you could also add more zeros. And that will actually put you in an advantageous position. What am I saying to you? I look at formal education as a zero multiplier. It is a force changer, it's a tool. <laughs> that the more people get it, the more people are able to understand it and use it as a social change tool, they stand out in society. They'll be able to change lives. Some of us who were raised by single moms, some of us who were raised in villages, um, when I say this to my students, they don't get it. That um, <laughs> um, uh, it, it took time for you to even, uh, if, if you have to see what an aeroplane looks like, you have to go on, on an excursion. You have to be taken in the car. Your mom had to pay. <laughs> And for us, for some of us, it was prayer topic. Lord, help me. <laughs> Someone will pay for my education to go and see an aeroplane. Yeah. All right? So, um, how did we manage to come from such backgrounds to where we are by the grace of God? To be able to do what we are doing. Um, I say it in humility. I traveled around the world to present at conferences, to chair conferences to give keynotes at places where if I, 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 if I ever imagined this some time ago, or I told someone they wouldn't believe it. Because actually where I come from in Ghana is not on the map of Ghana. I've had to just write to Google to say that, please, could you include that? Because there's a PhD holder who is coming from Ghana. <laughs> So, um, parents here and young people here, when we are talking about education, we are talking about a force multiplier. We are talking about zeros. Looking at the uh, parable I just told you, that the more you are, the more you stand out. Okay, so every now and then, 
my colleagues will call me and say, why do you have all these qualifications? I tell them, you don't understand. Okay, so let me <laughs> Now you're beginning to appreciate where I'm coming from. So you need a PhD, you need a first master's, you need a second master's, you need the bachelor degree, and you need all kinds of advanced diplomas. Look, uh, anytime I see a certificated, certificated course, people, I run after it because it's a zero. It's a zero I have to add to my one. Okay? And over the years, this is what has opened a lot of doors. This is what has facilitated the opportunities that I've, 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 I've had. By the grace of God, um, I say it with a lot of humility that I never thought that I'll be able to work as a principal research policy analyst for the Premier and Cabinet of Western Australia. I enjoyed it, but I had to leave the job because of the pressure. You, you, you couldn't make mistakes. The premier on, will be on TV or on radio, and the researchers will be behind the scenes, providing all the information. Now, when the opportunity arose for me to go in, back into academia, I grabbed it with two hands, because it's less where <laughs> my police would, uh, they would disagree. <laughs> okay, so you, you, you have to work in a different context to appreciate that academia, we are actually very relaxed because sometimes you can just work from home. In, in such context, you're always under um, pressure. Yes. Well, how have, have I been able to get into all these spaces? Um, in humility, it is just the fact that I've taken advantage and I've seen the importance of formal education. So formal education is a social mobility. It, it transits people from low socioeconomic status into something better. Cost. The, the, the whole debate about low socioeconomic status is actually debatable as well. It's, it's problematic. But the thing is that it, it pushes people from the, the, the lower ranks of the ladder up the ladder as well. In the long term, education has proven to improve people's income, their health, and their employment opportunities. It is also a type of social good that acquisition of formal education will also benefit larger society. That if you are, the, the more educated you are, the likelihood that you'll be a person that benefits uh, society in many ways. It equips people with the necessary skills and confidence to engage uh, in political and all kinds of um, cultural spheres of life. Education is also I found is a key determinant in predicting health and well-being. The more educated you are, the, uh, the more likelihood that you will engage in um, healthy habits. But of course, every now and then you see a bundle of contradictions in universities where professors are smoking. <laughs> <Don't tell me. laughs> right. So it provides life-changing opportunities and it also helps people to integrate well. If I want to now contextualize it to our situation in Australia. At the moment, our population as a, com as, as a community in Africa, uh, in Australia, sorry, is just around 1.5% of the Australian population. But currently, um, our, our, our boys and our girls are languishing in jail. In, in Victoria, specifically, Africans just make up just around under 1.5% of the population, but like almost 20% of the young, of the people in prison in Victoria are Africans. Okay, um, I like to always look at the granularity of the data. So when you drill down and you start looking at these people in jail, you check them and it's either no education or little education. It tells you the more educated people are, the more they become socialized to stay out of trouble. You wouldn't want to go and slap somebody if you have a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Who will pay it? <laughs> you reason up. <laughs> and that is why, I mean, where, where, where we were raised, you settle the matter before you come and report at home that or somebody, you, know, you, you settle the matter with blows. You know? I, I, I remember that those times 
you, you go out to the field to play and someone will beat you up. In my house, you don't come and report it. <laughs> if you won, then you report it. If they beat you, it's silent matter. <laughs> so on this fateful day, um, I went out and I didn't win the match. And I, it was actually a girl that beat me up. <laughs> they didn't say for three days until someone reported to my mom that your son was beaten by a girl. And he said, Kojo, you need to go back and win that fight. <laughs> so I was always looking for the opportunity where I would get this, because she, I, we, we, we call them Arab attack. It means uh, like Arab, the lioness. And she was someone, if she beat you, you should be thankful that you did that. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I've, I found a nice way of avoiding this Arab attack. It was just around that time that I became born again, thankfully. <laughs> so I gave the excuse to all that I'm not a Christian, you know, it's not a Christian. And after I that, that kind of issue was, I, I couldn't stand that game. <laughs> Compare that to Australia. You just walk away if someone is trying to pick up a fight with you. Because when someone is trying to trigger a fight, your mind goes to several places. Oh, my reputation. Oh, my mortgage, my children. Oh, this, oh, this, all oh, that. A lot of things uh, which you have accumulated as a result of your education to make you walk away. And this is also a reflection of a lot of uh, boys and girls who are languishing in jail because they have nothing to look up to. They, they, they have nothing that encourages them, that, that pushes them, that life can be better than what you are seeing, which is why education is very important. Can I give you some statistics in terms of the challenges we face as a community? At the moment, and this is based on my own research that I did, so uh, two years ago, myself and my colleagues conducted a study of um, Africans that finished high school here in Western Australia. So we traced them for 10 years. Those who finished high school here, um, say around 2009, 2008, wanted to know where they are and what were the determinants of their decisions post-secondary. Uh, people, um, I, I get sombered when I release these statistics. Majority of these young, energetic people are in factories not working as managers, not working as any influential people. They are cleaners, and they are casual and planning companies. Majority of them we found were also just moving around the streets. No purpose in life, just walking around. No direction. And I always tell my friend, Australians, and I said, when I ask you to help me to help my people, I'm actually making you safe. Because yes. everyone must eat. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone must sleep. If I am hungry and you, you have the food, I will come after you. Mm. So when we are educating people, we are actually making society safer. Yes. Yeah. When we are educating people, we're making our streets safer. Majority of our, our people are not going to school. At the moment, here are the facts. Africans in high school are in the low numbers. The few that are in high school, majority of them are not doing ATA. When I say ATA, the, the pathway that leads you to either university or higher education. Majority of them don't do ATA. And there are a number of factors that the research, uh, which is going to be published very soon, also uh, uncovered. One of it was that the schools feel that if you have Africans doing ATA, they are likely not to do well, so they will bring the reputation of the school down. Every high school wants to be in the top 100, and so they will rather divert you, you go do this, you go do this. It's a nice way of telling you, please don't, uh, um, then it's the image of our schools. And so if you took 10 students out of um, the ATA group, you like to find only one African. A case in point, 
had a girl that I was mentoring, clever. She was doing well in nature. And for some time, she just lost contact. And we caught up again three months later because I went to look for her. And she told me, look, I was afraid to come back to you because I disappointed you. I just dropped out of the HR program. I'm just doing general, nothing, not, not, nothing wrong with it because there are other pathways into you, etc. But why? And it was just the fact that she got told, you're not doing it enough to be able to get the score or the grade you need to tell the story of the success of our school. There are other factors I must admit as well. Less than 20% of Africans who enroll in a tertiary um, program or university graduate. Case in point, it is Kama University where I'm the discipline lead for a social science course. So a number of them drop out. Guess what? Unfortunately, these things and this discussion don't come up at staff meetings. Who cares? Who cares? To the extent that some academics were beginning to question why Africans are admitted to the university. Ten percent of Africans with refugee backgrounds transition to higher education in the first five years of their arrival. Less than ten percent. A few more statistics. Uh, people are more likely, or more likely, I should say, uh, to be racially discriminated against in school. And sometimes, when they raise the issues, it is deep legitimized. It is grow up, live with it, get a thick skin. It was just a joke. Not only that, but the problem here is a number of our people that even get qualifications struggle to find jobs. Get ready for it. The highest ethnic group with less job, or I should, I should say, unemployment in Africa is not really. To disaggregate it, South Sudanese. It was published a year ago in a research that was done by the University of Canada. Unemployment in Australia seems to be very low to the extent that our premier is going to Europe to go and beg people to come and work in Western Australia. Whilst around 25% of our population here in Australia as a community are not employed. Okay, let's come home to Western Australia. In the university I teach, if you take every semester, the students that fail their units, if you take every semester, the students that fail their units, on average, 50% of them are Africans. Yeah. It is a fact. Um, and these things are underreported because if no one is interested to bring it to the fore, it is considered as trivial. It's not mainstream. Who cares about that? But I do care. That's my passion to see our young people, because I've got three kids. I must say that, and I should have uh, maybe uh, uh, prefix this before I gave my speech, that it is not every African that is experiencing what I'm talking about. There are, so, there are some that are doing well, because there are different categories of Africans here in, in Australia. There are three categories, Caucasian Africans, Born, they look white, born in um, 
Zimbabwe, South Africa, Angola, if they manage the Australian accent very well, they have no issues. They mingle very well. All you need to be able to do is to say the man, man if, if they do it well, <laughs> they are all funny. <laughs> the, the second category are uh, the Maghreb and Africans. Our, our brothers from Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, out there. They have issues because the R always give them away because of the pronunciation of the R. <laughs> No, they, they try to assimilate very well, but somehow if an R is the way to get them out, ah, ah, no, they're not from here. They're from Libya. <laughs> they are also okay because their community is really strong. They, they, some of them don't even count themselves as Africans, I'm telling you. No. Yeah. You, 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 you meet them, you want to fraternize them, they go like, yeah. If you want an example, watch the... Soccer, World Cup, that is going on. Yeah. Moroccans are not saying they're Africans. Yeah. They said their victory is good for the Arabic world, yeah. not for Africa. Yeah. Right. And then we have the Sub Saharan Africans who look like me. Even within the Sub Saharan Africans, we have five sub categories. And the experiences are not the same. Category one are those that came here as refugees. Category two are the children of the refugees, that's the second generation. Category three are the professionals who have been brought here with four, five, seven visas and they work as professionals. They're brought here to work. Uh, they don't experience the kind of issues. Category four are international students. And category five are those that are here as uh, on what you call family reunion visits. So they could be any of they could be part of the, any any of the four, but they are here to join their partners whatsoever. So I must also uh, I must say that uh, whilst we're talking about challenges of education within our community, it is not every African that is going through. Because there are people that are living in City Beach, their kids are doing very well. And as an academic, I have time for my kids. Um, if you score uh, B, we'll have a conversation. <laughs> We'll have a conversation. And I'll tell you a story very soon. It is coming. But majority of the people from Sub-Saharan African backgrounds are struggling academically. They're struggling. I teach them in class. I, I, I see what they go through. I will never forget this incident of an African mom that entered my class. And she was breastfeeding. She just gave me breath, but she had to attend class because she was an international student. And uh, she put the baby in the corner. And every now and then, when the baby cried, she would leave and go and rest it. At some point, she felt it was becoming a nuisance. And so she stopped bringing the baby. But you could see that her breasts were full of, uh, it was staining because of the milk and all that. I had to make an executive decision to say, I turn you into an online student. The immigration people can go to hell because you are suffering. And I had to speak on her behalf to finish the course while I was taking care of it. But that's an exception. How many of them are resilient enough to be able to push through the systems? I see three problems of education within our community on three levels. One, at the personal level, two, at the community level, and three, at the institutional level. On the personal level, there is lack of motivation among our young people. Go to school for one. I can still earn that income. I can buy the woe, you know the woe? The youth. The, the, the youth, you know? They call it the woe because of how, when you're driving, the way it sounds. I can earn an income. So the, the motivation for education is very low. If you talk to, to the Af average African young person. And that's why sometimes I'm grateful that I was born in Africa. Because if Looking at this system and the way I like good things, if I were born here, I'm telling you, someone would have picked a seat to take, to take me to the classroom. I'm telling you, I'm being honest with you. Because this system makes you make it without necessarily going to invest or acquiring a qualification per se. Lack of motivation. 
I gave up on the personal level. They have no one to look at you. Because if, if mom had university education or mom is qualified in something, then you are motivated or they will talk you up to also go and get the qualification. But if there's no one to, to look up to, you are demotivated to do it. Again, bad peer mentoring, peer influence, and also misplaced priorities at the personal level. On the community level, it is profound. It is profound because our community, and I'm, and I'm talking out of respect because I work as a pastor, so I'm, I am on the ground dealing with daily problems. I don't sit in the, I, I don't sit in the ivory tower, just I, I am on the ground solving community problems, I'm telling you. We have an issue on our hands, you know why? This system, this system, provides the opportunity for us to neglect our children. All the night shifts and the weekend shifts are occupied by Africans. If we take it per capita, per community, we lack the night shifts. And so the problem we have in our community is that television is what is raising our children and the fridge is what is feeding our children. They come to school, I mean, they come from school, back home. There's, there's no parent at home to check on them. Have you done your homework? No, mom is on triple shift. Because they are looking for money. Money to do what? Not to invest so much in the children to build a mansion that they never need to enjoy in Africa. Yeah. Mansion that will go in two weeks, three weeks, Go ahead, and they are excited. That's my house. I call it funeral homes. <laughs> when you die, it's when you they will carry you back. There, there are people there who are enjoying these facilities, who have been living. And when the globe goes off, they will call your uncle. The globe has gone off. Bring money. Let's fix it. And we are running helter, skelter. This is the problem. When we're taking the night shades, we're giving penalty, we're giving compensation, we're giving more money on the weekends. But we are not aware of the problem it is creating. Because no one checks on the kids. And so you will call from where? Where are you? I'm home. How do you know? They are just hanging out with friends because it's mobile phone. And every now and then they say, put on the camera. I say, ma'am, I'm not putting on the camera. It's against my human rights. <laughs> and ma'am will, ma will be going bonkers with tantrum. When I come home, I will deal with you. I will deal with you. And you come home, he's already built his defenses. Mom, if you touch me, I'm leaving this house. Because I'm 40 years old, I'm 50 years old, I have my rights. And you go like, this is this, this is this. You bang on the wall for oh, nothing. The problem is not the child. You have chosen to chase money at the expense of your children. But if you have parents who invest in their children, it pays more than wanting to put up buildings and all that. Because I believe if you acquire all the money and all the investment properties and all the Billions, unfortunately, you haven't prepared your child to take care when you're no more. It will get funded to come back to zero. I'd rather invest in the children and get them to get me to enjoy life when I'm old. And by the way, I warn my children not to throw me to age care. <laughs> It's a contract at the side. <laughs> when you couldn't walk, I stayed with you. I took you to school. I bathed you. I took care of you. Don't dare throw me into any nursing home. No. We stay together. <laughs> if, if I am old and just in that state of not being able to do anything, pick me up, just drive me in the sand, 
bring me back in. I will be fine. If you take me to the aged care center or the nursing home, I will complain. So they, they, they kick me out. It's a contract I have with my children. Why? I've invested in them. I've been there for them. And here comes the story. Oftentimes, because of the busy shadows of our parents here, we are not able to follow up on what is happening with the kids in our school. Everything that's just right on the report. You say, ah, you. You see? See your face? And African parents can be really harsh with words. You see your face? You get D in English. Now you, now you start D. <laughs> Guess what? My first daughter came home with a B in English. And I said, it's not possible. B in English. I said, no, it is not possible. I said, that, I, I, that's what the teacher said. I said, are you sure? Um, do you think you, you did? I said, yeah, but I was expecting an A. But they gave you me B. I said, okay, no problem. Um, follow me. We went to the school. I said, who is the English teacher here? And oftentimes, A, um, what we observe is that African parents are not assertive enough to walk up to the school mm -hmm. and face teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that they get to, yeah. their hands are their back. Yeah. Very, very, very accepting yeah. of anything. So we with the English here. Yes, this is my daughter. She feels that she was in my room. Can we please check the grades again? Apparently, the teacher made a mistake. It was A that she was giving, but when they were entering the grades, they mistakenly put B there. But on their records, it was an A. Immediately, I requested that that may and they write a letter of apology to us because they had emotionally impacted on the children. We have kept the record until today. It's one of the records I will use when they determine these children to take me back to Nessie <laughs> Home. <laughs> My girl will take a bus to school every morning. And one day I receive a letter. Oh, the children messed up the bus. And they said it was your daughter that, that messed the bus up. Uh, that, that's what, that's what the, the, the letter said. I said, this is not possible. Why? I know how she's been raised. She can't she can lead her. She can't do that. And I called the school. I said, school, can you bring me the proof that it was my daughter that did it? Show me pictures. Else you are going to court. You were shivering like babies. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, it, it was actually a generic letter that was sent to everybody. I said, no, that's not how you write generic letters to African parents. Because I take it to me that you are yes. targeting yes. my daughter. Mm -hmm. And when you do this, you are impacting on her emotionally. Again, write us a letter to apologize. Within 48 hours, the, the letter came. The email came, I kept that one too. You know what I'm going to use it <laughs> <laughs> Parents are so busy, we don't have time to check out what is happening in the case school. If, as part of my research, parents don't even understand the educational system. They don't understand it. What is ATA? A what? What is general? All they do, take food, go to school. But well, have you come back from school? Ah, I don't know. Uh, nothing, nothing to check with homework because either we are busy or we don't understand the educational system. And of course, there is also the institutional level issues with racism and all that. That I really want to focus on that because it makes us feel that we are victims. No, if if there are if there are institutional problems and there are institutional problems everywhere, including Africa. Yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to blame it so much on the system. I feel that if we get it well at the individual level, pump them up, incentivize them, we, if we get it right as parents, the kids will be tough and resilient enough that no matter what you tell them, doesn't matter what you, well, whether you use the N-word on them or whether you, you, you discriminate against them because balloons fly not because of their colors, but balloons fly regardless of what they are because of the, what is in them. Blue ba balloons will fly. Black balloons will fly because of the air in it. Quite important. So it can, it goes back to the heart. If we are able to encourage and pump them up to know the value of it, 
regardless of what the teacher will say, it doesn't matter. They will push through. They will push through. Lastly, before I take my seat for the um, important wise people to talk, um, I want to offer some ideas for how we fix this. And of course, I must admit that it's not exhaustive. They are just um, indicative ideas to think about going forward. The first one is this. We need educational support programs. Extra curricular teaching programs. And by the grace of God, I started one, 2018. So we acquired a facility as a church uh, recently. Um, it cost us um, over a million and two dollars. So in it, we have our services on Sunday, but we have created two big classrooms where kids from African backgrounds come in. We teach them English, we teach them maths, we teach them science, and we also support them. We go. I, um, sometimes I have to I, I avoid wanting to see the email because I go to secondary schools doing advocacy for our, our people. All right. So those kind of educational support programs, and guess what? We need more people to offer these educational support programs. Because uh, the kids are so many, and we can only we only have this number of volunteers who are doing the programs. It's on Mondays and Tuesday evenings in Dutch. It is free of charge. It is provided by the church at our facility. But um, is that enough? No, because we are only in the north. How about those in the southern part of uh, Perth, Western Perth, um, East Perth, or all these places? We want to expand, but I'm also careful. Recently, I turned away some few students. A whole school, I, 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 I was invited by a school to talk to the teachers about African kids because they were, they were just driving them crazy. So I went to settle them. <laughs> all right. And I was telling them about, they, they were telling all the African students to ask about each of them. I said, I haven't got room for that because we, we only have about uh, seven uh, volunteers who are teaching them math, English, and science. And this is from year seven to year 12. So these things are relevant. Guess what? We are not funded. They do it for free. And the little uh, things we, we receive as a church, that's what we use to buy, uh, if you like, um, the full vouchers for the people that deliver the program. We need a lot of these. And thankfully, OAC is also considering helping in that regard. Again, I think that we need uh, community education about education. And this is something critical, like a forum like this where we talk about education, to provide the sense of what is happening. Um, and so we have made it a point as an organization, the organization that I run, Excellence Incorporated, to do this kind of thing once a year. Okay, so we, we did one, I think, last, last two years, last year because of COVID, we, we, we didn't do it. And then OAC, and we've always partnered with OAC, so this year when we, we heard that OAC is going to do this, I said I would rather come and uh, maybe be part of it than um, duplicate um, this. All right, so every year a forum like this, where we talk about education, we encourage, we explain the new, the new thing. I must warn you, sometimes, the, the Australians themselves, the principals themselves, sometimes get confused about the education system. On the panel, one of the sessions we had at ECU, I had, I had educationalists, people who teach in high school, including Australian principal on the panel. He said, sometimes I get confused with the high school system myself. So imagine an African parent who is semi-educated. How do you expect them to get it? But we can do it when we have these kind of um, uh, fora or these places where we share ideas. I feel that we can also motivate um, kids to take up formal education if we create um, incentives with an award system. So I'm, I'm encouraging OAC um, as part of what you do every year with the African Awards to, uh, to pick up a category that focus on something in education. Uh, some, someone that has done something in, in math, someone that has done something in English, someone that has done something in, in the educational sphere. Okay, because this will motivate the people to know that, look, I'm being watched. I'm going to be incentivized. And parents will pick this up. Oh, um, just do this. Imagine coming home with um, the placard that you won the, uh, the African with the highest educational achievement 
in 2022. The family will feel proud. All of a sudden, they'll begin to reason that, oh, it means we need to push you more. So I feel um, that OAC has the capacity to be able to create a separate category where kids will be um, awarded uh, this kind of incentives. Also, scholarship schemes as well. Scholarship schemes. Um, we started on a, a small scale, uh, at a small level, with the organization that I run in partnership with ECU. So what happens is every African that comes to the university, we pick you up and we bag you with somebody else that is also an African to work with you, to help you with the assignment, to explain things to you, to the extent that we're even paying for transportation for people to come and attend lectures. It got, it got messy a little bit because some of our people, they were in financial problems, not because of the education, but they had multiple wives. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you give them the money to go and buy, transfer, uh, uh, pass. They say, my second wife. <laughs> we have to stop. <laughs> Someone said that's discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a few more, one, one or two, and then I'll be done. And that is, aside from the motivation, yes, I'm, I'm encouraging that all the tertiary institutions here um, replicate some kind of a, a local African mentorship thing, like we do at DC. I will never forget this guy that was giving me a letter by the university that we are about to suck you. One more fail, and you're out. This guy was crying. Because he, he wants to succeed academically, but he just needed the support. <coughs> we picked him up and said, we will support you. We help this person. So our program provides one-on-one -on -one support for them, regardless of their qualification, if they want to. And then at once every week, we get them together in a plenary session where we teach them how to paraphrase. We teach them how to write. We teach them how to... Um, prepare for exam. We even have mock exam atmosphere for them to prepare them. Guess what? This guy graduated and he's now enrolled in a master's degree. Oh. If there was no system in place, we'd have gone down as one of the statistics of the, the Africans. But the system is what failed. And I believe that African problems should be fixed by Africans and people who mean well with Africans. Let me, let me say that in context, because we have a lot of people who don't look like me who are doing marvelous things for our community. And for you people in that particular, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> we need a lot of mentorship. We need to engage young people, consult with them, and the last but not the least, the last, the penultimate point is research. I try as much as possible to occupy that space, but I'm just one person. Um, and every now and then, I, I find myself fighting big fights. I was conducting research, I asked the Department of Education to give me statistics of Africans. They refused. They said they will not give it to you. Um, they, they, they just denied. We are not giving it to you. I went through my university, I went through the ethics committee, everything. No. Why? The, the statistics are green. And so they are concerned if it got released, everyone will get to see the full picture. All right. We need more researchers focusing on our issues. At the moment, the statistics of those African, our Africans who are enrolled in high school whatsoever, we don't know. Because the, the figures are there, they won't give it to you. And that's where we will ask OAC to play an advocacy role. Every now and then they are looking for good stories to tell. Do better trade. That's how Africans trade. Yeah. Yeah. Give me, make a deal. Yeah. Yeah. You want us to tell or come to our community program and to deliver this, okay, give us the statistics of Africans who enrolled in or who enrolled in high school in the year 2021. Give it to us. Or you won't show up. Deal. We need a lot of research because it is the research that will inform us 
on what to do to address the issue. The last but not the least is advocacy. Someone being a voice of education. I'm a full-time academic, full-time pastor, and I always find myself, because when you are in a pastor of an African uh, community, you are an octopus, you are in court, you are, in, you are, you are settling my issues, you are in the bands. Um, almost every week, I find myself going to one secondary school or the other to fix a problem for an African kid who is not getting along well with our people. I feel that OAC, you have a very strategic position. And um, if you take up the advocacy role, we will back you up with the research. We will back you up with what you need to say. Just create the forum. Just create the atmosphere. Let's talk for our people. Because I believe that perhaps the next person that is going to make us proud is somewhere there. The system is covering them. But if we get them to take up formal education, we will make us proud. Thank you. Thank you. That was moving, that was great. And I also did not tell you that he is an investor. <laughs> so if you, uh, you know, the Bible says, I am sharp and mm -hmm. All right? If you go close to him, you not only get education part of it, you not only get counseling in terms of the pastoral part of it, you also, he is also infectious in terms of investing. And so it is, it, it's a whole round. I think it, it is important for us to, uh, to be associated with people who are all round. Uh, so that when, when somebody is not giving you theory, someone is giving you practical things within where we are. And uh, thank you very much again. We've been for a very, very long time. And I want us just to stand up just a bit for five minutes and just say hi to the person who is next to you. We are not going for a break because one of our keynote speaker has a commitment very soon and we don't want him to go with all what he brought. So we'll just stand up, greet the person who is next to you and I'll keep in things in the, 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 our washroom. You go outside, it's on this side, on the outside. So, so stand up and, uh, and, uh,